we gain inheritance? What is inheritance? What is our individual inheritance versus corporate inheritance? That shared by the whole body of Christ. Those types of questions. Here's Acts 20. This is Paul standing before Agrippa. Paul's account of his conversion, Acts 9, Acts 22, and Acts 26. There's a lot to look at there. By the way, every time he described his conversion experience, the light gets bigger and brighter. (laughs) Just study it carefully. You'll see Acts 9 and then Acts 22. It's accelerated, amplified. Time to get to Acts 26. I saw a light above the glory of the sun. So Paul is growing in that revelation, and he's decreasing the whole time. That's quite an amazing story. But in Acts chapter 26, when he's speaking to King Agrippa, he's talking about the Lord's commissioning him. And he says in Acts 26, 15, well, Lord, who are you? The Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. But arise and stand on your feet. For this purpose I have appeared to you to appoint you a minister and a witness. That means you're going to set forth the evidence that Jesus Christ is alive in your mortal body. That's a witness. And you're a witness not only to the things which you have seen, but also to the things which I will appear to you. Second Corinthians 12, he says, I'll go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. That's progressive. By the way, after the prison epistles, there's no more appearance. It's a done deal. That's a whole other thing. I will appear to you. I'm delivering you from the Jewish people and from the Gentiles to whom I'm sending you to open their eyes. Don't ask me to do it. I'm sending you. I'm sending you to be a light to the nations, we see in Acts 13. To open their eyes that they may turn from darkness to light and from the dominion of Satan to God in order that they may receive forgiveness of sins. So this is where the whole church is. We talk about missions. This would be the whole core of what missions is. The people would say, this is the Great Commission. To go out so people can know what it means for Jesus to die on the cross for their sins so they can receive forgiveness of sins. But what about the end? And is the biggest conjunction in the entire Word of God. Because the and explains why you got saved. This is the whole purpose for salvation. That you might receive forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. So that sanctified by faith in me has nothing to do with receiving forgiveness of sins. That's a moment in time action of faith. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. The rest of the verse, to receive an inheritance, this only goes with inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Consequently, King Agrippa was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Acts 20, verse 32. Paul speaking to the elders of Ephesus there. They're referred to as elders. They're referred to as overseers. They're referred to shepherds or pastors. All three are found there in Acts 20. And he says, at the end of his time with those elders in Acts 20, verse 32, he says... These are saved men, for the most part, as far as we know. And now I commend you to God and to the word of His grace, which is able to build you up and give you the inheritance among all those who perfect passive participle have been sanctified. Inheritance and progressive sanctification are hand in hand. We saw in Ephesians 1 that we would know not only the hope of his calling, but what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. His inheritance in the saints. We have an inheritance in Christ. We know Ephesians 1.14, the Holy Spirit has been given to us so that we might receive our inheritance in Christ. So what is that inheritance? The inheritance is very simply comprehended in Hebrews 1 verse 2. God has appointed Jesus as heir of the entire universe. Heir. What does that mean? The one who has the right to inherit. He stands there as the heir of all things. And then verse 5, it says that he's inherited a more excellent name than the angels. When did that happen? Luke 2, 40 and 52. As he walked out in obedience to the Father, he grew in the grace of knowledge of both God and man. As he grew, that nature of God the Father is being formed in him. He's being conformed to the image of the Father so that when he reached the end of his course, he couldn't say at age 12 that he was seeing me as seeing the Father. He was advanced beyond the scribes and Pharisees at age 12, but he couldn't say that yet because he's still growing in the grace and knowledge of what it means to be in union with the Father through the Holy Spirit. By the time he got to the cross, he had finished his course, and now he's qualified to die. 
And he could then say, at the end of the sanctification phase of who he is, the Son of Man, he could say, he who has seen me has seen the Father. In John chapter 12, he who believes in me does not believe in me, but in him who sent me. The humanity of Jesus Christ reached a level of sanctification that to look at him, you see the Father. The same pattern is with us. The more we grow in sanctification and being conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, the more we are being conformed to the heir of all things. We know from Hebrews chapter 4 that God the Father has found his rest in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the Sabbath rest of God. So how is it that the Father, in the physical creation, on the seventh day he rested, when everything was finished, I say physical creation, I make a distinction between the earth and all that was created after Tohuwal Bohu for the benefit of man. He rested. And when he rested, what was his last act of creation? Man. All that in the restored earth is created for man. And he said, this is good, this is good. But when he created man, he said, very good. Man enters into the rest of God on a physical level. That's like a parable in a sense. So now, Jesus comes as the last Adam. He completes and perfects the obedience that the first Adam did not fulfill. And so as the last Adam, he perfects that obedience to the Father. And in that, he inherits a more excellent name than angels. I mean, that is just absolutely amazing to me. He inherited a more excellent name. What's name? Character and nature. That's a name. Character and nature. That's the Hebrew. If you give a son a name, that defines their character and nature. Jacob, you're a chiseler and a supplanter. That's his name. Before he became Israel, a prince with God. God has destined his son to be the royal heir of all things. He inherited a more excellent name than they. What about us? Are we called to inherit a more excellent name than angels? Absolutely. Look at the overcomer in Philadelphia. He overcomes, I will give him the name of the city of my God, the New Jerusalem. Think about this. This is a name that he's going to give an overcomer. I mean, this is just absolutely mind-blowing. He says to the overcomers there who persevere and have kept his word in Philippians 3.10. By the way, that's not a carte blanche rapture passage. It's only for those who are Philadelphian in character. Not everyone is Philadelphia, so you can't promise the rapture to a Laodicean. So I am coming quickly. Hold fast to what you have in order that no one take your crown. The crown is something that must be earned. It's overcoming. A crown, Stephanos, means it's the result of conquest. It's an image resulting in conquest. He who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. A pillar is that which represents substantial support in the kingdom of God. That which represents the dwelling place of God in the new city. You are going to be a conspicuous representation of what you represent to me as a pillar. And on the ancient temples, there were images of gods put on those pillars. So you're going to be manifesting the multifaceted glory of God in the heavenly city. You will not go out from it anymore, and I will write upon him the name of my God. There's nothing higher than this. I, Jesus, will write upon the overcomer the name of my God. That's inherited. The character and the nature. And he goes on to say, and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem which comes down out from heaven, from my God, and I'm going to write on him my new name. What's that new name? Jesus didn't receive that new name until he was resurrected. We know from Hebrews 2.10 that he's crowned with glory and honor. He was made a little lower than the angels during the incarnation. In 2.10, he was perfected through sufferings, and therefore he is the pattern of sanctification. He was perfected through sufferings. And Hebrews 5.8 it says, although he was a son, he learned obedience. The Greek says he learned the obedience. What is that? The entire obedience that God requires of the human race is perfected in him. It's corporate. So he learned the obedience through the things which he suffered, and having been made perfect, this is humanity. God can't be made perfect. He's already perfect. This is who he is, the Son of Man. Having been made perfect, he becomes to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation. So what is the inheritance? It's the measure in which Christ, who is the royal heir, is formed in you and me. And going back to Romans 8, 16, we are heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ, inheritors, provided that we suffer with him in order that we may be glorified with him. Heirs, inheritance. Christ is the heir. We're heirs of God, joint heirs with Christ. I pair, provided that, assuming that you understand this, you suffer in fellowship with him in order that you may be glorified with him. 
suffering with him. Now what about endurance? Second Timothy chapter 1 verses 1 through 10 and 11 we see what it means to be a good soldier and how to be disciplined as a good soldier, what it means to be an athlete, to play according to the rules in the Greek world. If you're going to qualify for the Isthmian Games or the Olympiads, you had 10 months of rigorous training in the gymnasiarch, the gymnasium. You had to get trained according to the rules. If you violate those rules, if you break diet, you're out. And if you've never read In the Arena of Faith by Eric Sauer, this will spell it out for you. There's no one that I know of that understands the issue of why Paul uses military metaphors, why he uses athletic metaphors. I don't know of anyone that articulates that better than Eric Sauer. And you can get it online. It's called In the Arena of Faith. In that passage, verse 12, if you endure with me, if you endure, you persevere with me. That is, I'm suffering in my body. I am going through sufferings. If you endure with me and my sufferings that are going on in my body, on the cross, we don't have a part of that. He's alone there. But his sufferings in the body, Colossians 1.24, if we endure with him as his sufferings are being perfected in the body, we are coming into fellowship with him and his sufferings in the body. If we endure with him, notice the word with him, the preposition soon means in fellowship. It's not meta in association. Soon means it's an organic thing, it's fellowship. If we endure with him, we shall also assume Bazalu, we shall reign as kings. But if we deny him, this is not salvation, this is inheritance. If you deny him, he will deny us. What? The reign. He comes back as king of kings and as lord of lords. Every king plural and lord plural are those who are the overcomers, period. Somebody teaches that, well, this is for every Christian then heaven is communism and our faithfulness means nothing and there's no need for a bemacy. And these theologians that say it's just going to be communism when we get to heaven, these guys should be thrashed. They should be taken out and thrashed. There will be vast distinctions in heaven. The distinctions between believers in heaven will be far greater than any distinction that's here on earth. Vastly different. Jesus says, from the least to the greatest, so shall be those that are in my kingdom. The least to the greatest. That means in the kingdom of God, there are the least and there are the greatest. There's 30-fold, 60-fold, and 100-fold. That's a difference. When it comes to the resurrection body, we know from 1 Corinthians 15, as one star differs from another in glory, differs from one another in glory, so will the resurrection be. Every believer is going to have a resurrection body. The Corinthians who are saved souls through fire, they're going to have a resurrection body. But you take someone like the Apostle Paul or John, they're going to have a resurrection body. What's the difference? Measure of glory and measure of conformity. Measure of inheritance. It all has to do with measure. Measure. We're called to attain the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So inheritance is the big deal after salvation. It's the central focus because from God's perspective, it just means this, that when we stand at the beam of the seat of Jesus Christ, how much of Christ is there? How much of Christ was formed in you and me in this life? If we stand before him a 100-fold, he said, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Why is it referred to as the joy of the Lord? Because it's more blessed to give than to receive. If we stand before God at the beam of seat of Christ and he gives us full reward, he's the most blessed. We enter into the joy of that blessing. God's not a communist. There are vast differences, and these differences have to do with ranking in the kingdom. He who overcomes will sit with me, not on my throne. That isn't what the Greek says in Revelation 3, 20 and 21. He who overcomes, I will grant him to sit down with me, not on, in the sphere of my throne. Throne is a pregnant verbal metaphor describing dominion, government, that which has to do with kingship. Thrones and kings go together. He will sit with me in the sphere of my throne. In the sphere of that throne, there's a whole hierarchy of authority. There's 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold. Throne union is conquest. And by the way, when that is attained leading up to rapture, then God will have the legal criteria in place to displace Satan in his hierarchy. And he knows it. Hey, brothers, everything I'm saying to you, he's got it. He knows this. This is no secret to him. Everything I'm sharing with you right now, the adversary knows. And he fears the church coming to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ because he knows that he legally loses his right to rule as the God of this age. So let's go back to the Old Testament. What's the example of inheritance? You'll read some commentators and they'll say, well, inheritance equals salvation. They dumb it down. 
they will say, when you believe in Jesus, you have an inheritance. Yes, I understand First Peter 1. You do have an inheritance. It's in him and it's kept in heaven. But Christian, you are called to grow up into him with reference to all things, Ephesians 4.15. Grow up. Those that say inheritance equals salvation, they are not discriminating between having received forgiveness of sins and an inheritance among those who are sanctified. They miss that. So why is this important, brothers? It's because the inheritance is that which gives God himself the riches of the glory of that measure of Christ that's been formed in you. Your inheritance in Christ is the Father's inheritance in you. We'll go to the Old Testament. I was looking at this the other day. You know, the priests, they had no inheritance in the land. The sacrifices are given to you as an inheritance. That is, you're sharing in Christ's death by way of type. Their priesthood was an inheritance. In several places it says, I, the Lord, am your inheritance. What an amazing thing. You priests, when you go into the land of Cana, that is the inheritance, that all the other tribes are to dispossess, you're not going to have any inheritance, for I, the Lord, I am your inheritance. That is a type and a shadow of who we are in terms of a priestly company in the Lord. This is Numbers 18. The Lord said to Aaron, You shall have no inheritance. Aaron, he's the, the tribe of Levi, he's priestly line. You shall have no inheritance in their land, nor any portion among them. I am your portion. I am your inheritance among the sons of Israel. That's pure beauty. That is magnificent. The Lord is the inheritance. So who we are as a kingdom of priests, the Lord is our inheritance. We're all a holy priesthood, First Peter 2.5. Royal priesthood, kingly priesthood, 1 Peter 2, 9. Verse 23, Only the Levites shall perform the service of the tent of the meeting, and they shall bear their iniquity. In other words, they have to do the sacrifices that demonstrate their right to come in the presence of God. There's sacrifices for them and for the high priest every year on the Day of Atonement. It shall be a perpetual statute throughout their generations. And among the sons of Israel, they, the Levites, shall have no inheritance. For the tithe of the sons of Israel, which they offer as an offering to the Lord, I have given to the Levites for an inheritance. Therefore, I have said concerning them, they shall have no inheritance. So not only I am the inheritance, that which represents the sacrifice of Christ shall be their inheritance. So I'm going to just kind of sum this up and try to give a context in terms of Old Testament imagery. When the New Testament uses terminology, in this case like inheritance, and you have a theologian that tries to come up with some kind of an answer to this based upon whatever's going on in their head, the only Bible that the early church had was the Old Testament. So right away, if you mention the word inheritance, what would any person in the first century associate inheritance with? The land of Canaan. It would be automatic. You wouldn't even have to teach them. So what is the land of Canaan? God told the sons of Israel there at the Passover that you obey me, you enter into this covenant with me, you walk as I tell you to, you obey me, and you shall go in, and I will give you the land as your inheritance. We have this promise given to that first generation. The first generation died out. And only two got in. Plus, those that were born in the wilderness and therefore not circumcised. So what we see is that the first generation died out because of unbelief, but only Joshua and Caleb had a perfect heart because they were willing to follow the Lord their God more fully. That's Joshua and Caleb. So they're a type of overcomers. And the rest, the majority, died in the wilderness. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 1-14. through The Corinthians were ready to lose their inheritance. So God promises them the land of Canaan. And he says, I'm giving you this land, It's a land full of milk and honey, Deuteronomy 8. In other words, by way of typology, the antitype is all the fullness of God's blessings in Christ. So Christ is our Canaan by way of antitype. You go in and you possess this. By the way, I've given it to you, but only the place where you put your foot down is going to be yours. Let me read a section from Numbers, and I want to give you some scripture, because I don't know all that you're hearing. I'm going to read from Numbers, because Numbers is the ordering of the tribes as they're going through the wilderness, and as they're setting camp and set up the tabernacle, they're there in the presence of God, they break camp. So you have about 33 or 34 stages of the journey of the children of Israel through the wilderness, okay, which is a tremendous thing. And we see they journeyed, and they journeyed, and they journeyed, Numbers 33, and they journeyed, and they journeyed from one place to the other. 
the center of that is the tabernacle which is Christ and you have the three orders of the Levites and you have the four different sides of the tribes divided up into four sections verse 49 they camped at Jordan from Beth Shemesh and as far as Abel Shittim in the plains of Joab then verse 50 the Lord spoke to Moses in the plains of Moab by the Jordan opposite of Jericho what's Jericho? that's the gateway to the land of Canaan the inheritance Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, When you cross over the Jordan into the land of Canaan, then you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you, and destroy all their figured stones, and destroy all their molten images, and demolish their high places. That is of idolatrous practice. So for us, we're not into physical war. We have to take down principalities and powers if we're going to gain our inheritance. They have to be taken down. And it can't be done by individuals. By the way, the whole armor of God in Ephesians 6 is in the plural. Put on the whole armor of God, that has to be plural. Application is one thing, but it takes local churches. So we know if they're going to possess the land, they've got to dispossess the enemy. Verse 53, And you shall take possession of the land. What is that? Their inheritance. And live in it. For I have given the land, their inheritance, to you to possess it. I've given you, church, your inheritance in Christ, you must possess it. So it's received forgiveness of sins like we saw in Acts 26 and an inheritance among those who have been sanctified by faith in me. Okay? So we read on. And you shall inherit the land by lot according to your families. So this is a corporate thing. You can't do this individually. This has to be done as families. For us, that would be this local church family, this local church family. They're all over the world. The Lord knows who they are. The larger you shall give more inheritance, that is more capacity, you shall give more inheritance, the smaller you shall give less inheritance. There's capacity. That has to do with measure. Less inheritance. Wherever the lot falls to anyone, it shall be his. And God in his sovereignty knows what choices we're going to make. You shall inherit according to the tribes of your fathers. But if you do not drive out the inhabitants of the land from before you, then it shall come about that those whom you let remain of them will become as pricks in your eyes and as thorns in your sides, and they shall trouble you in the land in which you live, and it shall come about that as I plan to do to them, so I will do to you. And so you look at the book of Judges, you look at the end of Joshua, and what happened? God rebukes them for not taking full possession. To sum up is that The first covenant was given to Moses on Mount Sinai, and the first generation died out in the wilderness. Joshua and Caleb survived. Those that were born in the wilderness from 20 years old and upward that were not circumcised, they had the opportunity to come in the land. But what were the conditions for them to come in the land and to possess their inheritance? Well, Deuteronomy is the renewal of the covenant. Deuter, second, namas, the issuing of the law. The book of Deuteronomy is the renewal of those covenant stipulations that God gave to Israel. So you read through the book of Deuteronomy, it's all about inheritance. It's all about inheritance. God gives these instructions and he says, now I remind you what happened to the first generation. They didn't get in and here's the reason why. Now if you want to go in and you want to take possession of this inheritance, here are the rules, if you will, to possess. Under the blood in Exodus... That brought redemption. So they come out of the Exodus, they had to go through the Red Sea and then cross the Jordan to come into the inheritance. What do we see in Joshua? Before that new generation come in and they've been instructed in the entire book of Deuteronomy, and I'd recommend you just read the entire book of Deuteronomy in one sitting, because then you can follow the thought of why this covenant is being renewed to this generation. The whole issue is they need to come in and take possession of the inheritance. Joshua comes in. Moses represents the law, and the law can't bring you into the inheritance. So who brings you into the inheritance? Here's the book of Hebrews. Jesus, because Joshua is Jesus. So the law can't bring you in, but Jesus will bring you in. All this is typology and antitype. It's just amazing. If you're going to come in, if you're going to take possession of your inheritance, you have to dispossess the enemies. In the Hebrew, if you're going to possess your inheritance, you have to disinherit the occupiers. To dispossess means you disinherit. The enemy already has an inheritance there. It's an iniquity force. It's sin. These principalities and powers that rule over jurisdictions, cities, and over nations, they're there because of the iniquity force of God's people. It's incredible. And Satan is leveraging the iniquity force in the body bride of Christ today. So anyway, we just bless the Lord because he's the designer of all this, and it's way too much for us. 
But Father has his inheritance in the Son. He's the heir of all things. And now as we grow up into him with reference to all things, we're coming into conformity to the image who is God's royal heir. I'll pause there. I guess now let's go ahead and do question time again. Is that okay? Yeah, whatever you choose. Yeah, that's fine. Well, let's just start. With the inheritance, I can see a thing where you'd be more focused on trying to do the things to gain your inheritance instead of being like Jesus. So if we are more like Jesus, our inheritance will come. Yes. Am I understanding that? Yeah. That's, yeah. that's perfect, yeah. The more you grow up into him, and you're occupied with him, looking off in the way to him, Hebrews 12... He's the royal heir of all things. As you're growing up into him, coming to know him as your life, and walking out in faith and obedience, that which is walking in the light as he is in the light, it's happening. Okay. Good question. Okay, so my question, Doug, is first, just a comment. It seems that the principle of inheritance means that the prize is God, really. So you're winning the most valuable thing that there could ever be or possibly is. There's not really anything better that you could be winning, if I'm understanding correctly what this matter is over. But then out of that, it's like, I don't even know that you can do this, but I'm going to throw it out there and ask anyway. Can you describe in the best terminology that comes to mind what gaining Christ looks like versus not having gained him as much? Like, what is the actual divide there going to look like once we're actually to the point of receiving our inheritance. I'm trying to get it in more concrete fashion so that my brain grasps better the concept of what there is to win. Okay. Jesus Christ is the archetypal template for what it looks like for a man, for God to totally possess in the sense that God has his inheritance in a man. Now, Jesus, the Son of God, is co-equal and co-eternal with the Father. But in his humanity... He is crowned with glory and honor. Crowned there in Hebrews 2 means he's victorious. It's Stephanao. It's a victory. If God's intention was to crown man with glory and honor. Jesus now as the forerunner, he as man for man is now crowned as us and for us. If we value Jesus the way God values him in growing more and more, we come to see and love Jesus through the heart of the Father more and more. We're coming into oneness with the heart of the Father whose Sabbath rest is in Jesus. We come to the place more and more where we're actually loving Jesus Christ more and more out of the heart of God the Father. As that growing spectrum keeps enlarging, then God's fullness that's in Christ begins to be imparted to us. Because we're to be filled into all the fullness of God, Ephesians 3.19. So that fullness is already in Christ, but how do we come into that fullness? Well, there's a cross, and through that cross, as we grow up into Him, the fullness of God that's in Christ bodily, God's incommunicable attributes cannot be given to us. God as God can't make us a partaker of the Godhead. We can't be omniscient, we can't be omnipresent, we can't be omnipotent. But there are moral characteristics in God that are perfected in the manhood of Jesus Christ. So Jesus Christ is the quintessential. In other words, he is the epitome of all that God intended man to be. In him all the fullness of God indwells bodily. So as we're growing up into him, we're becoming less, John 10.30, as we decrease, he increases, he grows in us. This process of sanctification is a process of assimilation, where what we are in our old humanity is progressively decreasing through the work of the cross, As that's progressively decreasing, we more and more, through being conformed to his death, are coming more and more into correspondence with Christ in resurrection. As that is a growing sanctification process in us, Christ, who is God's royal heir, that's the measure in which we're coming into our inheritance. As we become a partaker of the divine nature, it's there, new birth, but we have to become a partaker. Fellowship, that's 2 Peter 1.3 through verse 11. It's a growth process. All of this is accumulative, and each one of us has our own track and journey. But when it's all fulfilled in the corporate body of Christ, Jesus Christ will have the complement and fulfillment of who he is in his glorified humanity. The body of Christ, which is the fullness of him, that fills all in all. This is so big. I mean, it's so big, and it's hard to get our head around it, but he's the author of this. And I think if we just keep it very simple and say, you know what, I'm not sure I'm getting all this, But whatever light that God has given you, whatever light it is, if you walk in that, 
and you're going to win. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, and that light increases, as we walk in the light as he is in the light, we keep walking that light in faith and obedience, faith and obedience, faith and obedience, pick up our cross and denying ourselves and following him, the rest will automatically take care of itself. That is the pathway to inheritance. Is Jesus said, he who loves his soul life will lose it, but he who loses his soul life for my sake and the gospel shall gain it. The soul has to be one. It's a growth process, sanctification, and none of this should be complicated because if anything that is said, they say, well, I'm not sure I understand this. Well, what you can understand is God has already given you light. Are you doing anything in secret that you would not do in the presence of your wife? Is your life the same in private as it is in public? If not, you're not walking in the light. This is an inheritance issue. You're not two people. That's James. You're two souled hypocrites. So we have to take very seriously that who we are in private is no different than who we are in public. And each one of us know if there's any contradiction between that. If there is, we as Lord, put your finger on that, and we need to deal with that in grace, and I need to maybe let go of some things, and I need to come into submission to you, Lord Jesus, for you to be in me that which I cannot be in myself. If it's a secret sin or something, whatever it is, not that there is no secret sin, hidden sin. We need to deal with it. By the way, Josh McDowell, in his presentation, you can look it up online, 50 to 60% of pastors in the United States are addicted to pornography. No inheritance there. No inheritance there. That's a dead loss. That's all fire. It's a plague. It's one of the greatest plagues that has ever hit our nation. It's enormous. So Josh McDowell, he's done a whole lecture on this. I saw it and I was shocked. I've had to face the same thing in my own history online stuff, things come up, you know, you're going to click the thing or not. If we choose the fear of the Lord, like we see in Proverbs 1, a choosing of the fear of the Lord is I choose not to offend God. So all the inheritance is very practical. Who we are in public is who we are in private. If I'm understanding correctly, I don't think this captures all of it, but maybe this is an aspect of this inheritance of actually receiving Christ. It's almost like salvation would be like getting married to your spouse you either are married or you're not. That's the foundation. But then after marriage, there's a whole realm of intimacy with your spouse that is a great gift. And you can choose to enter into that or not. You have to submit yourself to that working, and things have to die inside of you to be able to do it. So the difference in inheritance would then look like someone who does not receive a lot of inheritance in Christ would be somebody that does not have a deep relationship with him when they go to heaven. Therefore, their inheritance is a small inheritance. Whereas someone who has really received a lot of Christ has a very intimate relationship with him and is able to receive from him intimately, and that would be the measure of a large inheritance in Christ. Would that be a fair comparison? I'm saying yes, and maybe just thinking about it this way. Paul says, I'm in travail again until Christ be fully formed in you. That's Galatians 4.19. That formation is more foul. It's essential form. It's not schema, outward form. Do not be metaschematizo, conformed to this age, but allow yourself to go on being transformed by the renewing of your mind that you might know what the will of God is, is good, well-pleasing, and mature, perfect. I'm in travail, and that's the Holy Spirit and Paul travail until Christ be fully formed in these Galatians. Fully formed is obviously a process. I'm in travail, that's a woman who is pregnant. It takes time for that child to gestate and come to the place where it can be born. So I'm in travail again. Travail. So Christ be fully formed in you. And when he's given birth, we begin to see him manifest in your life. He's just not on the inside. He gets a release. Everything has to do with measure. In Ephesians 4, 7, each one of us has been, by the ascended and resurrected Christ, each one has been given a gift according to the measure of Christ. So we think of that gift as something apart from him, right? But the gift of Christ, it's appositional. Each one has been given a gift according to the measure of the gift of the Christ. If you want to be accurate, you can smooth that out and make it sound like the gift of Christ. But it's also correct to hear it, is that each one has been given a gift according to the measure of the gift of who Christ is that gift. So we have it in seed form. Remember, he who is begotten of God does not habitually practice sin. He's not able to sin because God's sperma abides in him and he cannot sin. 1 John 3, 8. His seed abides in us. Well, that seed's there at new birth. 
but that seed needs to go through a gestation process and reach the point where there is manifestation. There is a coming out of that which is the character of Christ, we call it the fruit of the Spirit. In eternity, what we're going to see in relationship with one another will be the glorification of that which represents the measure in which Christ was actually formed in us in this lifetime. The measure in which we were conformed to his image. It has absolutely everything to do with measure. Now, if you want to see the type of this, go back in Ezekiel 40 and look at the Millennial Temple there. You see a man there with a measuring rod, and everything in the temple is according to measure. And what's that temple? That's the dwelling place of God, right? And everything has to be in order in a certain way. You just read through those chapters. And he measured, he measured, he measured, according to measure, according to measure. How is it that the Millennial Temple is described in such detail over and over and over again, according to measure? God is measuring every one of us according to Christ. According to Christ. He is the standard bearer. Revelation chapter 1. He stands in the midst of the assemblies as the plumb line. Amos 7. He's the plumb line. And the churches are being measured according to him. And wherever there's a misalignment with him, we see in Revelation 2 and 3, there's some aspect of Christ in Revelation 1 that is brought in as the criteria. Jesus introduces himself as the measure, and he says, I commend you in this, but I have this against you. In other words, every church is being measured by Christ. That's here on earth in time. At the bema seat of Christ, we're all going to go into eternity with a specific measure. Once we enter into eternity, of the increase of his kingdom, there will be no end. So if someone like a Corinthian goes into eternity versus the Apostle Paul, we enter at a certain foundational measure. But as that increase goes throughout eternity, it's exponential. It's exponential, mathematically. God is the author of mathematics. So you take someone like Demas, who having loved this present age and has gone off to Thessalonica, and someone like Paul, they enter into eternity, the beam of seed burns off everything that's not according to Christ, and then you go into eternity, and whatever measure you have, the increase of his kingdom, there will be no end. As you go into eternity, the measure of the glory of Christ in Paul will be exponentially greater than that which was there at the beginning with Demas. In other words, heaven will always be growing, expanding, and getting bigger and better because that's how we all individually and corporately are going to be seeing God. He's always going to be increasing, and yet he can't increase, he can't change. He's absolutely infinite. So for us to be in heaven, heaven is a place that's never static. It's always dynamic. It's always increasing from our perspective. What God has given us in his book is enough. But the most of what God has to say to us, it's on reserve. I've given you enough to get you to the threshold. But when you get there, the best is yet to come. If it's on an individual, personal inheritance, one star differs from another. This is an individual but I know there is a necessity of the corporate in how that gets played out for me as an individual, right? There's an inner working, like Jesus is coming back for a bride, and the measure which he's formed in me, it's interwoven in the context of the body, right? So how does that play together? I know the connection, but how are you experiencing that connection? Even the word, how's that connection? How's that played out? Because it's really easy, it's super easy, especially as an American, to go to the individual. It's about me, it's about my inheritance, and I'm praying that way too. Lord, I want to come into all the inheritance that you would like for me to have. I want to be a hundredfold guy, not a thirty. So how does that play out mm -hmm. in the text of the body? I really like that, I want to be a hundredfold guy. If there's a thirtyfold, that's good ground. Sixtyfold, that's better. Hundredfold is best. So the fact that there's a best... Who would not choose for the best? I don't even understand why anybody would even settle for less than that. But there's those differences. Some say, well, you know what? 30 is good enough for me. At least I get in. So there's a difference in heart. Caleb and Joshua had a different heart. They were willing to follow the Lord their God more fully. They're the example. The individual, we have our personal walk. Because Revelation 2 and 3, it's to the one who is overcoming. It's individual. And the context, he doesn't say... Hey, you person there at Tara Tara, this pornographic Jezebel church, I think you should leave and go to Philadelphia. He didn't say that. He said, you overcome right where you are. 
Now, that doesn't mean someone couldn't leave another church. I'm not saying that, but that's the framework. So overcoming is individual. But you can't overcome unless you're in that church. You can't do it on your own. And the illustration of that is found in many places of the Bible, but just, so for example, judges. Okay, They hadn't conquered the whole land yet. There's a lot that had been conquered, but there's aspects of the land that was still under enemy grip and territory. And God confronts that at the end of Joshua's life. And now we have the book of Judges, which is a series of cycles that he did not conquer the whole land. And if they don't conquer the whole land, guess what? The enemy comes in and takes them down. There is no static. You're either coming in and take possession, you're either dispossessing these enemies, or they're going to corrupt you. That's the whole book of Judges. So notice in Judges chapter 1. Now it came about after the death of Joshua that the sons of Israel inquired of the Lord, saying, Who shall go up first for us against the Canaanites to fight against them? So obviously the whole land wasn't taken in Joshua. Read the whole book of Joshua. They took a lot of territory. They didn't get it all. And it actually says they were not able to. In other words, the level of sanctification within those tribes was not to that place where they had the wherewithal to do it. So he says, Who shall go up with us to fight against them? Verse 2. And the Lord said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have given the land into his hands. Then Judah said to Simeon, his brother. So, individual, you need to go into your inheritance. You're going to need to have koinonia. Hebron was the place of fellowship. It's going to be corporate. Judah said to Simon, his brother, Come up with me into the territory allotted me, that we may fight against the Canaanites, and I in turn will go with you into the territory allotted to you. Corporately speaking, church, when we see the weakest member, we gather around. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 12. The weakest one, we gather around and help lift them up. Those who are weak, we know from Romans 15, we are strong, though bear the burdens for those who are weak. So a local church is a hospital, actually, in a lot of ways. It says, I've given apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, hyphen teachers. It's a hendiades in the Greek. It's not pastors and teachers, it's pastors, hyphen teachers. For the equipping of the saints, so the saints are going to do the work of the ministry until we all attain. The word equipping of the saints, katartizo is the noun. We see that the apostles, when Jesus came, they were mending nets. Katartizo. They're mending nets, which means they need to be restored to function. You look up that verb, katartizo, you can look it up. You guys have been to seminary, you look it up and say, oh, there's a metaphor. We see Paul's telling the Corinthians to be perfected. That is, to be adjusted and, if need be, restored to function. Because you're out of order, you need to be fixed. Katartizo, that's the noun. This particular place in Ephesians, that's katartismos. In fact, Galen used the term katartismos as setting a broken bone. And you can find this in the lexicons. For the equipping of the saints, the setting of the broken, and what purpose? So they can become useful. If we are just satisfied with our walk with God, and we need to be satisfied, where is Jesus suffering to see this other member to come into a place where they're restored and they're healed for the equipping of the saints, that is the restoration of the saints? Notice here in verse 3, I'm going to go up, get my inheritance, you help me, and then I've helped you come into your inheritance. So that's koinonia. That's the fellowship of the saints. And Judah went up, and the Lord gave the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hands, and they defeated them, etc. You go on and read, verse 8, the sons of Judah fought against Jerusalem. What we see is a collective principle that if the inheritance is going to be taken, it's going to be done within the context of local churches. Why? Because 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 15, the church, that is in that context, is the pillar and ground of the truth. So we have our individual overcoming, but the context is within a local church. So if people are going to be serious about overcoming, you cannot be out of a local church. And don't look for a perfect local church, because as soon as you show up, it's not going to be perfect anymore. <laughs> It's not going to be perfect. And if you look at 1 Kings 7, the stones were being cut at the quarry to be brought in to build the temple of God. They were being measured and cut. And it says, when they're being brought to be assembled, there's no sound of hammer or chisel. So the local church is the quarry. And God building his heavenly city, these things are being put into place and there's no sound of hammer and chisel. So what is going on here on earth, who we are yet to be, is being built We don't see it. And I think I'll close the illustration with this. Corrie Ten Boom, who was in Nazi prison, she was speaking at a group of people. She suffered greatly. Her sister Betsy died because of the Nazi abuse there in that Nazi prison. 
and she would look out to people who are very discouraged and sometimes hopeless. And she'd just smile, and she'd say, you know, there's no suffering so deep that Jesus is not deeper still. So she was just really a radiant person. She would hold up this tapestry, and on the back of this tapestry, you see all these gnarly threads, you know? What is this? None of this makes sense. You see this? And she'd show all these little different multicolored cords on the back of a tapestry. She says, this is what you see. And then she turned it around, and there's a picture of Jesus. This is what God's building. This is what you see, but on the other side, God is working all things together to bring you into conformity to His image. That's the inheritance. It is coming into oneness with the character and nature of Christ, who is God's royal heir.